Hello, everybody. I'm Jeff Prokovici. I'm the uh, San Francisco Bureau Chief from Inc. Magazine. And uh, with me is Matt Williams from Pro.com and Marco Zapacosta from Thumbtack. Uh, so guys, let's start by talking about where we are in the, the evolution of this space that your companies have basically created over the last few years. W what's this going to look like for consumers five years from now and for uh, the contractors on the other side of the platforms? I mean, I would argue it's day one. You know, it's a lot like e-commerce in the late 90s, early 2000s, where it's still almost a new and different avenue for customers to hire service professionals online. I think we're at the very start of a tidal wave of that cultural shift happening. And um, part of it is sort of trust. Being able to trust the internet enough to bring you a human into your home is a much higher sort of threshold than simply bring a product into your home. But I think that is changing, and with that, um, we're gonna revolutionize how customers accomplish their projects and get things done, and on the flip side, how these professionals grow and run their business. I mean, to think that it's a trillion dollar industry that's effectively completely analog today, um, you have to assume that in five to 10 years, there's gonna be radical shifts towards digitizing it sort of across the board. I, I would agree, and in fact, I, I would say it's even kind of minute one of day one. It is so early in the process of that transition uh, from analog to, to digital. And really the last few years, the, uh, the creation of, of kind of a computer in your pocket, a remote control for getting anything done, uh, both for the consumer and for the pro in this case, where you can now run your business uh, you know, from, your, from your phone, from your smartphone. I think that uh, it, is, it is early, uh, it's in the infancy, I think, of connecting up consumers and pros uh, digitally. So you guys both sort of, I think, touched on this a little bit in what you just said, but why is this challenge of connecting the consumers with the pros um, harder than it might look to somebody who hasn't tried to do it? And, and what's, the, you know, what's the key insight that each of your companies is bringing that explains why you think that you can you know, grab this gigantic, gigantic market that's uh, sitting in plain sight? Yeah, I'd say it's, it's highly fragmented. So as, as everyone in this audience knows, it's, uh, it's a highly fragmented audience uh, in terms of pros. And they come and go uh, in terms of their businesses, uh, the ebbs and flows of, of activity when they need demand, when they don't need demand, when they go out of business. And, and ultimately, uh, for the consumer, who is it that I'm trusting to come into my home? As, as you know, kind of Marco commented as well, like having that, that relationship with kind of trust and transparency uh, and also kind of price. Um, a lot of consumers don't trust, you know, getting a price uh, without really having somebody understand their job. And so I think it's a combination of those factors that make it very, very tough. And up until recently, it has been entirely, you know, kind of analog. I mean, I think the largest, the largest, uh, you know, kind of driver of or connector between uh, customers and pros historically has been probably Craigslist after search engines. And, uh, and that's all changing with the, you know, applications now being much richer and much quicker to get connected to a trusted professional. Yeah, I think Matt hit on it, the fragmentation on both sides, right? So we're both in the business of connecting the needs of customers with the talents of professionals. And there's no place today where you can just tap that. Um, there's nobody who has a catalog of all the professionals, their talents, what they do, what they charge for it, when they're available, what they're interested in. So we have to build these, you know, think of it as a database or a community um, to simply deliver the service to the customer of connecting them with the right professional. And that's incredibly laborious. You know, think back to when the first uh, travel companies existed um, online. They had to go out and sign deals with every hotel to bring their inventory online. That's effectively what we're doing, except there's probably two orders of magnitude more suppliers in our marketplace than there were in the sort of travel industry, which is much more aggregated. And so that is the core challenge, that to build these rich user experiences and to build sort of an end-to-end -end experience where you get somebody to done, you need a very deep and intimate connection with these businesses. You need to know about them, you need to know what they want, you need to deliver things that they want at the right time. Um, and that's something that nobody's ever done before on Earth. Um, and Matt mentioned this sort of smartphone, which I think is the reason why we're having success today um, and it was never before possible because finally you can connect with these people, these professionals, whenever, wherever. Can, can you, I'm, I'm curious about that um, because I mean, I can understand why, it's easy to understand why, why an Uber couldn't have existed before everybody was carrying a smartphone, but it, it seems like 
uh, you know, hiring a, a plumber or a house cleaner isn't something that you necessarily have to have mobility to do? So, so think about uh, the historical way you would have solved this problem. It's always been easy to find names and numbers. So if you're looking to hire a plumber, you look it up in the yellow pages or on Google, you instantly get more numbers than you know what to do with, and you can call down that list. But we've all done it, and to get two or three professionals to get back in touch with you, you have to call a dozen or two. And that's because there's no live connection with them. You as a customer are polling all of them to see who's interested. The dream, and what sort of Matt and I are working on, is to remove that sort of pain in the ass for the customer and deliver them the right professionals, ideally instantly. To do that, we have to have not just awareness about who's out there, but a way to pull them, to connect with them at any time to get them to respond to that customer. And that means a live connection, which a smartphone enables. You know, These are folks who primarily uh, work for themselves or very small companies, so there's not often a front office staffer picking up the phone, which is why you don't often get picked up when you call in. And so the smartphone becomes the bridge between our marketplace and these professionals. And I would add to that. I think when, when there is a job in hand and we can get immediate kind of digital connectivity to a pro, that pro who we know has experience in doing a, you know, a significant amount of work in painting houses or painting rooms and the person is looking to get a house painted uh, instead of the you know, general handyman that maybe paints a house once a month, once, a, you know, one, once every couple of months. It makes a huge difference to both know the experience set, the skill set, and the, and the kind of recency of that experience in addition to the connectivity so that a smartphone kind of enables a much faster method of, of identifying those skills and experiences in terms of onboarding and, and bringing in a pro into our network. And then also, just in terms of the connectivity, as Marco mentioned, being able to instantly access, do you, you, know, do you want this job or not, through our app. So let's talk about the, uh, the, the needs of consumers versus the needs of contractors. Um, people talk all the time about creating that, uh, that wow factor with uh, these new mobile services. How do you, what is it that, that wows that consumer, and what is it that wows that that person on the other end of the platform, and are those two needs ever in, in conflict, and how do you resolve them when they are? So our view is that what both sides are after um, are sort of mutually beneficial. So a customer is trying to get a job done, and a professional is trying to make money by getting a job done. And so the wow factor on Thumbtack is after spending just a minute telling us what you need, we can ideally, if we do our job right, get you five fantastic introductions within just a few minutes. Um, and that's happening in our richest markets, where in 10 minutes, you're getting five great quotes with reviews and pictures and data and all the information that you need to make a great hiring decision. So you went from nothing to having the right person for the job in ideally 10 or 15 minutes. So it's radically faster than they could have done offline or without Thumbtack. And for these pros, the magic is for the first time, they have a marketing solution that is bringing customers to them. They're not phishing, right? They're not buying impression-based ads or click-based ads or even lead-based ads, but they're paying for introductions to customers that they think they're a fit for. Um, and they love it, and it's why we have incredible retention among these professionals, because they found a repeatable way to get in touch and get hired by the customers that they're after. And that's it. very similar for us on the consumer side. They're looking for price, kind of trust and transparency. Uh, and, and I think what we've found is that price has been paramount. Being able to get a price for a job today usually requires you to pick up the phone. There are very few services, I think Thumbtack included, where you, you, know, you can uh, query a handful of, of pros simultaneously. Uh, but you know, getting that price is what's paramount. And, and customers don't want to pick up the phone. <laughs> they don't. They do not want to pick up the phone if they can avoid it. And so, uh, and so our service uh, is, it was created for that kind of pent-up demand. What does it cost to paint a room? And you can literally go to pro.com and type in paint a room or paint my kid's bedroom, and it'll show you for your zip code what it will cost, what it should cost. And then we connect you to a pro that has experience doing that. That barrier for consumers was huge uh, in terms of you know, being able to, to find that. We've had you know, a couple hundred million dollars in, in kind of projects priced because people have this desire to get price first. On the pro side, it's, uh, it is the convenience of being able to have a job coming directly to them. Our model is a little bit different from, from most out there. We're not in kind of the lead gen, you know, kind of orientation. We, we only charge if a job gets uh, provided to a pro, gets completed by a pro. And so for us, pros love that because they get to see actual jobs. They only 
pay anything if a job actually comes their way, they complete it and get paid for it. So it's the it's finding the motivation on both sides, uh, and it's really price for for you know consumers and uh, really having quality jobs for pros. Um, so most of these big sort of peer to peer platforms, two sided markets, whatever you want to call them, everybody on the on the platform is doing more or less the same thing. You guys, both of your platforms cater to to people offering a pretty wide range of different services. How uh, does that create any any unique challenges? Have you have you found as you've uh, as you've you know, opened up these platforms that sometimes it's very different connecting someone to an electrician than it is a house painter or a dog groomer or whatever else? So, I mean, I think you nailed the challenge in building our marketplaces. Uh, because these professionals are specialized, they're not fungible, right? Your electrician is not going to be your caterer and they're not going to be your wedding photographer. It simply takes different professionals to do those jobs. So if you think about an Uber, they're live now in 300 cities and you can argue they have three SKUs, you know, Uber X, Uber Black, and a big car. Um, Thumbtack has a thousand unique categories and is live in every city in the United States. So the number of sort of SKUs or markets that we need to fill and have liquidity for is orders of magnitude bigger and that makes, that's the fundamental challenge that we have. Thankfully, what we've seen though is that from a customer perspective, um, when you're talking about these um, sort of not commodity jobs, but where you're really after a, a professional to help you out, there's an enormous amount of commonality across all of these categories. And actually hiring a caterer for a big event is very similar to hiring a contractor. You care a lot about price, you care a lot about quality, you care a lot about professionalism and timeliness. And these are all things that we can build one platform to serve all these customers across all these various categories for. And Sorry uh, to interrupt you, but is, is there, do you need, any expertise in, how much expertise do you need in the categories that you're providing through the platform? Do you need to know anything about we, catering to? We, we do, and, and thankfully we have so many professionals on the platform that we can leverage them, you know, because they're always going to be more expert in our categories than we are, and so now we have a category management team who leverages our community to make the product better. So our questionnaires that help interview customers and identify what they need are really done in light of what the professionals tell us they need. And so they are the main driver of that intelligence. We just try to organize it effectively and prioritize it effectively. Yeah, and that intelligence is critical. So we've, we've worked with uh, pros all across the country to evaluate for every different job type, what is required, even in that city, that locale, that state. And so when we're you know, working with an electrician uh, in Seattle versus you know, Wichita, Kansas, there might be different kind of local regulations in terms of uh, the licensing requirements and all of that. So it is, um, it's a combination of knowing that depth of what's required that I think helps find you know, the best kind of highest quality, but also uh, you know, finding the skill set that matches the job. And so how many, you know, how many uh, ceiling fans has this electrician installed in the last year versus a handyman who does it you know, once a year? Uh, so I think the combination of those two factors make a big difference. So we have land grab right here in the name of our panel, which implies that there's this sort of unclaimed virgin territory and whoever gets to it first gets it. Is it, how, how accurate or inaccurate is that? Or, or is, this a, is this a case where um, first movers are gonna win? Is this a case where it's, it's winner take all? Or are we going to see different winners depending on the city, the region, the category, yeah. et cetera? This one definitely, it reminds me of the early, earliest days of e-commerce uh, in terms of you know, 1998, 99 when there was almost a, a vertical player uh, or multiple vertical players for, you know, uh, for every type of you know, commerce activity that you could start. And ultimately over time, I think what, you know, what clearly happened there, and, and I was uh, involved in the earliest days of Amazon's you know, kind of build out of third party marketplace. And what happened was uh, you know, business models, certain business models succeeded that were superior. Uh, you know, the, the challenge of actual logistics around, you know, kind of managing product delivery was very difficult in different verticals uh, over others, and consolidation occurred. And so I think over, you know, probably the next five or ten years, you're going to see uh, consolidation occur in our industry as well. Uh, and some, you know, some winners that have really iterated on the best business models and the best, you know, uh, ways to serve pros and the best, best way to serve consumers are going to win. But there will be many winners in this game and some, you know, fairly large ones and then probably a number of niche players as well. I, I think that's exactly right. I think we're in the, like, Cambrian explosion era of this sector 
um, and you're seeing so many different models attempted, uh, vertical players, horizontal players, end-to-end -end experiences, all sorts of different types, um, and that's a reflection of us not knowing exactly what's going to work. We've made our bets, lots of people made their bets, um, but I agree with Matt that over time, um, there are real returns to scale. Um, be it from a supply side acquisition side or a customer acquisition side or from the product platform that you can build and serve people more effectively and therefore this will consolidate and I would argue um, there's no reason why it wouldn't become as consolidated as e-commerce um, which at this point you know there are two or maybe three huge players in the US um, and I think that's the type of consolidation that over the long run, 15, 10, 15, 20 years, you'll see in this space. Um, and these companies will be enormous. Uh, I think people don't appreciate that always because there's not an offline counterpart to what um, Pro.com or Thumbtack is doing. There was a Yellow Pages, certainly, but that was a static repository of information and therefore very limited in what it could offer. You know, these end-to-end -end marketplaces, these peer-to-peer -peer marketplaces can do way different and much richer things. And through that, I think build companies that will be on par with eBay and Amazon and Alibaba in the future. So you mentioned uh, huge e-commerce players in the US. Um, Amazon has a, a, a contractor uh, marketplace now. Google is is building its own as well. Kind of makes me think of that moment when the uh, the mob realizes that your business is more profitable than they thought, and they decide that they're gonna, you know, move in next door. Um, what? I would not make that association. <laughs> <laughs> That's just me. So, okay, well, what what does it? How does this uh, this change the game? These two these two guys uh, parking up, you know. Right Matt, outside your door. You're the Amazon vet, so you yeah. So I, I I spent uh, almost 12 years of my kind of life and career at Amazon. I uh, and it built some of the earliest days of Amazon's marketplace. I, I have nothing but respect for what uh, Amazon's doing in the space, and uh, and in fact, I think there's probably more opportunity for you know companies like ourselves and others to even partner with Amazon than there is, um, you know, kind of a, a competitive threat. Listen, I think that that what is happening is the larger players that, that come into this 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 uh, this space are really accelerating the efficiency right i mean this is a this is a huge uh, game of market inefficiencies where uh, there are you know, literally uh, hundreds of thousands to millions of pros that are uh, active uh, every day around the country around the world and you know how can you provide a better experience to the customer and that is going to, you know, this is definitely going to be a case where rising tide will lift all boats in terms of pushing uh, each other in terms of what, what Thumbtack is doing, what we're doing, what Amazon's doing at, you know, creating this connected world where you can instantly get access to a really trusted professional. And, uh, and so I think that, you know, this is a, this is a you know, five to ten year, uh, you know, kind of marathon, not a, you know, one year who's going to win today. It's, we're far from that. It's definitely a marathon, though I may have a more cynical view than, than Matt. Um, my view is that Google and Amazon are chasing this category um, in large part because it's the one of the few pots of gold left that's big enough to entice even players at their size. Um, you know, local services alone is seven, eight hundred billion a year in spend. Um, that is just enormous and something that can matter even to a Google or an Amazon. So I think that is their motivation. Um, the question becomes, um, despite the desire, are they well suited to actually execute on this specific problem? Um, or is the sort of strategy tax or sort of um, general um, sort of inertia that they have with what they're already going to do with them keep them from solving the problem in the way that it should be solved? That's sort of my theory, but um, you know, we'll see. And it's, it is going to play out over years. It's not going to play out this year over next, or next year. So, so Amazon knows if you've just bought five gallons of paint, you know, Google knows if you've just searched for a house painter. What, what do you think about each of those as a sort of uh, beachhead in this market? I think that, you know, attaching services to products is fantastic. Uh, it's probably also where there's, I don't know, 5% of the industry spend, maybe 10%. It's, uh, it's a small portion of what is happening out there in terms of overall services. I, I think that's right. And it also speaks to what Amazon has done, which is try and fit its service marketplaces into its product marketplace. So it's very SKU driven. Um, you know, you can go to amazon.com slash services and you can buy like a plumber off the shelf. Um, I don't 
I don't think that's right. I mean, maybe for highly commodified service purchases, um, the, particularly the ones that are all alongside product purchases, but if you talk about hiring a contractor or a caterer for your wedding, these are so intimate that I just don't think the storefront model, the SKU-driven model is appropriate for what customers truly want. Now, maybe I'm wrong, maybe they're right, but that's the bet that we've taken. Um, I think Google, unlike Amazon, has more uh, sort of uh, fundamental challenges in that their DNA is not lined up well with solving this problem, which is very operationally intensive, requires a lot of curation both of the community and also of the product um, to sort of make it fit each vertical. And they like to do things, you know, purely programmatically. They don't like offering customer support even for their big AdWords spenders, let alone, you know, the little professionals who are only spending a couple hundred bucks a month. So. Um, they certainly have the opportunity, given the search volume that they have, but um, I think it will be a slog that they're not up for. Um, let's talk about a, a different model. Uh, Handy and Homejoy, we're, we're hearing that they are, uh, that, that one is going to buy the other now. What, what do you make of that, and, and what does that say about the approach that they've taken to providing uh, these sorts of services? I think we're still early, and I think that uh, the economics of uh, house cleaning, uh, I think both of us probably know and and uh, and have seen in the industry, it's it's really hard to make it work. I think that it, that that is probably consolidation of that space is probably earlier than perhaps others because of that. But uh, I think it's a it's a natural evolution of uh, of the space and la and kind of what's going on with land grab. I will be less diplomatic than Matt. <laughs> I think it's a function of it not working. Um, and I think they have tried to um, sort of build a venture-backed company in a space that won't actually support it, both because of the underlying economics as well as the challenges in scaling it. Um, I mean, I think in some ways it's, it's very sort of humbling and, and it sort of nice that you know, here you had two MIT grads who started Homejoy um, and an HBS grad who started Handy. And they set out to build sort of a better cleaning company. And my view is that they haven't been able to do it. And it's because building a great cleaning company and build, being a great sort of service professional is really hard. And in that, it takes a lot of dedication and a lot of effort that's independent of writing great software. Um, and so I think our view is that we want to build the platform to empower the tens of thousands, the hundreds of thousands of cleaning companies around the country to serve their customers ever better. Uh, we don't have the pretense to believe that we can be a better cleaning company. I think that is shockingly hard um, and something that many fail to appreciate. Well, let me play devil's ad advocate here for a second because you guys both talked about how crucial the issue of trust is when you're letting people into your homes, you know, when uh, I've used uh, Homejoy and, and knowing that there was a company actually standing behind what they did and, you know, a company that I could call if I had any problems versus just kind of a, a platform who's, who provided an introduction, uh, definitely, definitely made, you know, was, was a big part of the appeal. So can you, can you provide that level of trust without actually managing the whole, the whole chain? So I think we we certainly think you can by the vetting that you do of the of the professionals who are going into the home. So I think if you if you don't put kind of the con the controls around that, the you know kind of the survey post fact, the evaluation, the background checks, the licensing, right, uh, for different you know pros of different types. Uh, but for house cleaners in particular, I think that what you can learn from the past customers and from existing profiles, existing ratings, existing reviews that are out there uh, is really, really important to that connection. And so I think if you can do that homework for the customer, you have done them a huge service. And then being able to make sure that you close the loop after the fact on was it a quality experience with this professional, uh, that's really what matters at the end of the day. I totally agree. I think you absolutely can. And think about it historically. Um, the vast majority of cleaning companies were not brand names like Molly Maid or Mary Maid. Um, they were just small sort of two, three, five person shops. And they projected their trustworthiness through word of mouth, through a friend's recommendation, a neighbor's recommendation. So this has already been happening and is solved. The question is, how do we port it online? How do we create that same network of trust, that same uh, ability for these professionals to project their professionalism and trustworthiness online? 
And I think you know it's it's challenging, and there's lots of steps that you have to get right. But there's no question that can happen. And what gives us a lot of confidence is you know look at dating apps. You know, 10, 15 years ago, I think if you talk to people, it would have been crazy to just swipe right on this screen and go meet someone in real life. But that's happening. Um, and it speaks to the ability for these platforms to create sort of trust and community that lets people interact even in the real world. And I think Matt and us are trying to do the same thing for the world of local services. So uh, last question. This, this gigantic issue couldn't, couldn't be any bigger of uh, of who's an employee, the, the W-2 economy versus the, the 1099 economy that, uh, that could have such an impact on the models of so many of these uh, marketplace companies. How does, that, how does that map onto the space that, that, that you guys are in and to the approaches that your companies have taken versus the, the handies and home joys? We, we are thankfully uh, uh, sort of uh, beside this whole debate. So because both Pro and Thumbtack are focused on helping customers hire professionals and we don't deliver the service ourselves, uh, we don't come even close to employing these people, even on a 1099 basis. So I think for us, we're immune, but I think for the broader sector and certainly other models, it's a huge threat. It is, and I, in, I look at it in a very similar way. We are connecting up the trusted professional who is, in most cases, licensed, bonded, insured, right? They're, they're providing a service out of their own business. It's an already established business. It's very different for, I think, the model that we have uh, collectively taken and the approach that we're taking versus being able to kind of pluck individuals out of companies who are providing that service today and hire them as contractors. I think that is a, uh, a business that is you know, getting a lot of scrutiny right now, uh, both I think from a public policy perspective as well as, uh, you know, uh, as from a uh, kind of a labor market pool. And, uh, and I think it's just a, it's, it's years to be solved uh, in terms of how to do that effectively uh, in the support of the employee and, and their kind of uh, you know, rights. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's tricky. I mean, technology is uh, empowering to customers in its ability to sort of provide convenience or choice, um, but it doesn't always do the same thing for the supply side or the labor side. And there's some of these models that treat labor as a commodity. Um, for right or for wrong, the models require that. And then there's other models like ours that treat the supply side as actually you know, what is being sold, what is being connected to. So it's not a commodity. These professionals are their own brands, they have their own reputations, and we're simply sort of helping them project that and connect with the right customers. So I think uh, we thankfully are, are sort of immune to this issue, but I think it's going to be a big one. Well, thank you very much, guys. Great, uh, great, great talking to you. Thank you. Thank you.